point to the logo on my chest and tell him, Slam me, ego, slam me, ego, slam me, ego, slam me, ayy. Hit it up hard, hit him with strike, from the national anthem to the bottom of the night. I'm in, slam me, ego, slam me, ego, slam me, ego, slam me, ayy. You already know what's up, what's that another home run? What's up, everybody? Welcome to episode 448 of the Talking Friars podcast and YouTube show. Ben Fadden with you here. This is going out on August 18th, 2023. That is a Friday, uh, and we're recording this on a Thursday, so just uh, a warning there before we get started. Jim Callis is the special guest here today, prospect guru. Love watching him and reading his stuff. Uh, on MLB.com and with MLB Pipeline and does work with Jonathan Mayo as well. Um, so it's great to have Jim on. He's been on before, and there's a lot to talk about. So, Jim, thank you so much for the time. Oh, yeah. Glad to be back, Ben. I always enjoy talking to you. Yeah, thank you. So I want to first start off. We're going to go in multiple directions, but I want to first start off with what the Padres gave up at the 2023 trade deadline. There were moves that they made where they brought in some marginal players. I think they got a little bit better. They didn't want to go all in. And they already had a lot of the superstar talent already on the team. But obviously with those trades, they had to give up some talent. And the notable names, I think, on this list, you know, Jackson Wolf, Ryan Weathers, some names that, you know, Padres fans know. Alfonso Rivas, I don't think that's a big name, but he was at the big league level for the Padres this season. So just your thoughts on the packages that AJ gave up. Um, do you think that any of these guys, AJ will end up regretting giving up? you know, years down the road? Not, not really. I mean, Ryan Weathers is obviously the famous name because he's a top 10 pick and he got to the big leagues really fast. If I remember correctly, did he make his big league debut during the playoffs? The pandemic? Yeah. yeah. Like, and so, I mean, he was quite famous for a while. I mean, he's the biggest name, but he kind of stalled out, to be honest. Um, you know, I guess Jackson Wolf is probably the biggest name prospect right now, but he's more of a, kind of mid-level prospect. Like, I don't even think – I don't do our Pirates list, but I don't think we put him in the top 10 of the Pirates system. They, they have a deep system. I mean, he's okay, but you can replenish guys like that. Um, you know, Henry Williams was interesting. I mean, I think Henry Williams, before he had Tommy John surgery at Duke, was trending towards first round, and then he missed all the 2022 season. So there's some upside there. Um, but, you know, but they got him, I want to say, in the third round of the 2022 draft. Um, you know, Esther Suero, Esther Suero is, is a little bit interesting, but I mean, I think I've said this, or I know I've said, I don't know if I've said on your show, Ben, but when I've done some Potter stuff, I mean, one of the things with AJ Prowler is I think like you could call it confidence, arrogance, faith in his scouting and development departments. I just feel like under AJ, the Potters feel like there's always another draft. There's always another international period. We're always going to go find more prospects. and None of these guys was a, a cornerstone of the Padres' future. So, you know, but even when they've made the big trades, like when they made the Juan Soto trade and they gave up all kinds of big-name prospects, I just think the attitude is we're the Padres. We'll just go find more players. And, I mean, you look back to a year ago when, you know, the Juan Soto trade was grabbing all the headlines and they traded five top, you know, two Abrams and Gord graduated, but five guys who had been, you know, top-notch prospects to get Juan Soto. And here we are a year later, and Ethan South is one of the best prospects in baseball. They hadn't even signed him yet. And Jackson Merrill I, I was coming back from an injury. He hadn't played a ton in the minor leagues. Now Jackson Merrill's top 10 prospect. And they've had another draft. And they had another international, pro, you know, uh, you know, period. So I just think they feel like they're always going to be finding prospects, and especially in, in deals like these where it was kind of like you said, they weren't going all in and they weren't, you know, make, you know trading – you know, Jackson Merrill didn't go anywhere, and they're certainly never going to part with Ethan Salas. Um, but yeah, I don't think they're really going to regret. I mean, some of these guys may pop, but you know, for what they are right now, like I, I think all the trades made sense to me. They were, they were kind of trying to make some you know minor moves at the deadline without sacrificing a big part of the future, and I don't I don't think they did sacrifice a big part of the future. Yeah, I agree there. I wanted to stick on Ryan Weathers, the first round draft picks in the past for AJ Preller so far. And I just wanted to ask, like, your thoughts on that trend that we're seeing with A.J. Preller, where, especially, like, pitching. And I know it's been some circumstances where Mackenzie Gore 
he obviously still has promise and he was just dealt for Juan Soto. Like you understand him not having a yeah. bunch of success with the Padres because it was just a trade. But there have been some in the past where it's first round picks, they come up and there's an impact, but it's not as it's not as good as I think some Padres fans were expecting or hoping. So what is the reasoning do you think behind that? Is it Preller not drafting the right guys? Is it just favoring stars over them in trades? Is it the developing? You know, is there something there? Or is it just again like the wrong draft picks? What do you think on that? I think a lot of it too is I think there's some like there's this expectation. I think in all sports, like a first round pick is going to be a future star. And and every year I do a story for MLB.com where I go back to the draft 10 years ago and redraft it based on what we know now. And by the time you get to the end of the first round, you're seeing guys like Alex Claudio and Tommy Hunter and John Jaso and Steven Vogt being like retroactively, they should have been first round picks. You know, in a typical draft, you have like six or eight guys who are truly stars. And then you have like a dozen, maybe two dozen in a deep year where guys have solid big league careers. And then you have guys who kind of intermittent success. And I actually think, you know, it, it, the, I think that the perception there, I, I don't think the Potters have drafted poorly in the first round. They just haven't kept any of their guys. I mean, I'm looking back, you know, you look at, you know, the, they didn't have a first round pick in 2015. I can't remember if, when AJ came in exactly, but his first first round pick was Hudson Potts. And that wasn't a good pick. I, I think that was a money saver so they could spend money later. It, it was. It, but, like, he wasn't a first-round talent. But they also took Eric Lauer the next pick. Eric Lauer's been a good big leaguer. He's just done a lot of it for the Brewers. You know, the next year they took oh, – and, and that year with their first pick – I'm sorry, they had three first-round picks. Their first pick was Cal Quantrill. Cal Quantrill's actually been a pretty good big league pitcher. But, again, yeah. it hasn't been in San Diego. So that first year, Hudson Potts was a money saver. And they took Quantrill and they took Eric Lauer. And those guys have been good first round picks. They just haven't done it in San Diego. The next year they took Mackenzie Gore, who is off to a good start. He's still young, but I think that's going to wind up, you know, when I do my story in 2027, Ben, of the top retroactively, who should have gone the first round? I'll bet Mackenzie Gore is still a first round pick. I mean, maybe he won't be the third best player, but like he looks pretty good. And he got him on Soto. You go to 2018, you know, Weathers, you know, got there quick and it just hasn't happened. I think he's more the exception to the rule. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's funny just looking at this list, you know, their supplemental first round pick that, that year was Xavier Edwards. They traded him 2019. They took CJ Abrams. They traded him 2020. They took Robert Hassel and they took Justin Lang in the sandwich round and they traded both those guys. So I think part of it is that I think some of these guys have been good big league players. You know, CJ Abrams is pretty interesting too. It's just, they haven't had that impact in San Diego but they have had impacts elsewhere. And again, yeah. I think it goes back to that kind of mindset that like AJ's kind of been all in for, I've lost track how many years in a row it is, but they're not afraid to trade prospects because they feel like they'll go out and they'll get more. And I mean, you look at the last couple of years, you know, Jackson Merrill looks like a great pick in 22. Like to Dylan Lesko, who's come back from Tommy John, he's looked promising. I mean, it's still very early, but right. Robbie Snelling, who they took in the sandwich round, has looked very good too. So I think they've drafted fine. It's just you haven't seen much impact in San Diego because they've traded so many of the guys. Yeah, and I think sometimes there's this narrative out there that with after the Juan Soto trade, right, the, the, the whole farm system's gone and <laughs> Padres don't have this strong farm system anymore. And I think part of that is because of where the Padres are at at the big league level right now. And when there's been injuries, who has been called up? Ryan Weathers before he was dealt. Jackson Wolf came up from double A to make one start in Detroit. Reese Kinnear, I know he has Tommy John surgery, but it was those guys. And I don't think that impresses a lot of Padres fans. Right. So I yeah. think there's that. But I still see it as a strong farm system. I mean, you go look. Sure, triple A, it's not great. But there's guys in double A. There's obviously Salas. There's Merrill. There's Robbie Snelling. There's Dylan Lesko. There's Samuel Savala. Like, there's a lot of talent. Dylan Head is, I think, top 10, and he just got drafted, obviously. We can talk about him here. But, like, it's there's a lot of talent. It's just at the lower levels of the minor leagues. Yeah, we actually ranked their system ninth. Uh, and we just did our farm system rankings a couple days ago, and they came in ninth after being. 28th a year ago at this time and 23rd coming into the season, you know, and we, we've talked about some of these guys like 
It is a little early. They have five guys on the top 100 after trading all those guys last year. And that's not even counting guys. They have guys like Jairo Arte and Adam Mazur are pitching really well. They have guys like Brandon Valenzuela and Nathan Martorella, Jacob Marcy, Graham Pauly. Those guys are hitting well. Yeah. Like they have depth. Like, like I, I agree. I mean, look, I mean, they've kind of like, I don't know if Max stops the right word. They have a very, very high major league payroll. And they've had a very frustrating season where like their record in close games is crazy poor. If you look at you know the record based on run score and f- for and against, they should have the third best record in the National League. They might not make the playoffs, so it's kind of a crazy year. So they weren't going to go nuts at the trade deadline necessarily. But had they wanted to, had they wanted to go out and make a big deal, they could offer a guy. Like it'll be curious to see. And I'm not like the Angels pulled Otani off the market, but I I guarantee if if Otani was on the market, I don't know that they would have gotten him. But the Padres could have put together a very strong package for Shohei Otani had they wanted to go there. They, they were one of the teams that could have done that. Um, you know, we wouldn't just be dreaming. So, yeah, I mean, their farm system, just with, with guys they've added, with guys who've gotten better, they look significantly better than they did a year ago when they kind of emptied it out. You know, they promoted a lot of guys and, and emptied out a lot of it to go get Juan Soto. Yeah, for sure. Moving to the 2023 draft, what I got from that, obviously, Dylan Head was the first-round pick. And Homer Bush Jr., I believe he's already in Lake Elsinore. Like, I'm already seeing some of the talent already there. And it was a lot of up-the-middle talent. And there was a lot of pitchers selected by the Padres, which isn't shocking. Like, that's what A.J. Preller has done in his history. He loves the up-the-middle talent, athletic guys. And, you will you know, if, if they're going to be big leaguers, we'll find out a position later. Like, that's what it's kind of been if guys are blocked. Um, what did you think overall of this 2023 draft for the Padres? Yeah, I mean, I thought they did. I thought they had a lot of interesting guys, especially considering they didn't have a second round pick. I mean, Dylan Head's one of the the faster players in the draft, and he's not like the slap hitting speedster. Like he's not gonna be a thirty home run guy, but he might be a fifteen homer guy. Maybe maybe he even gets to twenty. But like he, he hit the ball with more authority this year. He plays good defense. He's like kind of your classic center field profile. You mentioned Homer Bush Jr. Yeah, he's super interesting. He can really run. He still looks so slender. Like if they could get some strength to him, he's got some bat speed for power. He never hit for a lot of power at Grand Canyon. I think he's got to get stronger, but there's a lot of upside there too. And then those were the two biggest names, but like J.D. Gonzalez, the catcher they drafted out of Puerto Rico, um, he's got raw power. He's got plus arm strength. He's got rece- promise as a receiver. So he's kind of interesting if he wasn't a big name. And then they got a couple of high school pitchers late that were – were you know kind of they, they paid over slot to get him is what I'm struggling to say. Cannon Kemp in the eighth rounder, he was a potential top five round guy. He's six foot six, kind of a late bloomer this year. I, I think there's more velocity in there. Um, he's got some feel for change up, he's got a slider, I mean, he could be a three pitch guy. You know, in the 11th to 12th round, 12th round, they got Blake Dickerson who came into the year like as a potential top three round guy, didn't have a great spring, but he's a guy who's who's pitched well on the circuit before. He's got a good slider. He's got a low 90s fastball. He's got feel for a changeup. He's a guy with a lot more upside than a 12th rounder. Their 11th rounder, Carson Montgomery, had a rough year at Florida State. But, like, if he can get back to, like, he's had a mid-90s fastball times in the past. He's got a hard slider. He's got feel for a changeup. Like, you know, their 8th, 11th, and 12th rounders, you know, talking about some of the pitchers, are better than your typical eighth, eleventh, and twelfth rounder. So I, I like I like their draft. I think there's a lot of uh, a lot of upside there. What about Jackson Merrill? Obviously, he is in the top ten for the Major League Baseball prospects, not just obviously Padres. Where do you think he's going to fit in at the big league level? Assuming he doesn't get dealt, <laughs> where do you where do you think he fits in with Xander Bogarts? Obviously, Manny Machado, Jake Cronenworth, Hassan Kim. I don't think he's going to return after next season, so he could fit in there. But that might end up moving Xander Bogarts to a position like first base or having Jake Cronenworth play first base and Bogarts play second or Merrill play second and Tatis stay in the outfield. Do you see Merrill potentially moving to a different position? How do you see that happening there? Yeah, I mean, I could see him moving. I mean, he's, I think, gotten... He's improved his quickness. So I think he's got a better chance at shortstop. You know, since he signed, he's improved his quickness. He's improved his arm strength. 
So I think he's got a better chance to stick at shortstop. I mean, when they drafted him, it was kind of like you were alluding to before, you know, they, like they, they were drafting a guy who could really hit and then they were going to figure out, you know, where he played in the long run. I, you know, I think, you know, I think he's one of the things, I think he's going to hit enough. That he's going to find a spot in the lineup and it just depends on the makeup of the team at the time. Like whoever has the best, you know, defensive ability shortstop will probably play short. And whoever's the best defensive ability after that will probably play second. You know, I think Machado's ensconced at third. And then everybody else will kind of move around to, you know, where, you know, wherever they see fit. Like it's possible, you know, looking forward, you know, maybe Trent Grisham, you know, when Merrill's ready, maybe Trent Grisham's not there and Fernando Tatis is playing center. And one of these guys slides to the outfield. Like I, I think it's very much TBA, but I will say I do think because of the way he's enhanced his quickness and his arm strength, Jackson Merrill's got a better chance to play shortstop than when they drafted him. I think that's good news for Padres fans for sure because I think Padres fans, I think the best thing for us is you have Tatis in the outfield. He's shown that he can play the outfield really well, and I don't think we envision Xander Bogart sticking at shortstop for the rest of this contract for sure. No, so I think that will you know allow the best players to be in the lineup and – some might have to change positions, but that's okay at, at the end of the day. Moving to Ethan Salas, the guy's 17 years old. And I was reading, it wasn't MLB.com, but obviously another publication with Kylie McDaniel, ES, Kylie McDaniel ESPN, uh, about him and Bryce Harper was mentioned in there. And I think those are, maybe it's okay to compare the two, but obviously Ethan Salas didn't grow up you know, in America and the, the the high school and just the traditional route there. How do you see Ethan Salas fitting in here in this Padres team down the road? Like, when do you see him possibly debuting? And this is obviously probably pretty difficult to predict because this isn't just a position player. It's a catcher. And sometimes catchers do take more time to develop. But... AJ Preller hasn't been afraid to rush guys. I don't, I don't want to say rush, but really fast track guys. If he sees something, he's not afraid to test them at higher levels. And he's already through Lake Elsinore, and now he's already up at High A in Fort Wayne. So, what do you think of Ethan Sal Ethan Salas so far? And uh, just where do you see him fitting in eventually? Yeah, no, I mean, the, the Harper comparison is interesting. I mean, they're different types of players, but in terms of, like, being uncommonly talented and advanced at age 17, I, I can see that part of it. You know, he's not going to have – he won't have Bryce's power, but he's going to play power. And, I mean, it's hard to think of guys to compare to Ethan Salas, honestly. I mean, he's 17. He's in high A as a catcher. I don't know if I have ever remember that happening before, and I've been covering prospects for 30 years, a 17-year-old in high A. And – you know, he is super advanced. You know, he was born in Florida, so he spent some time in the States. He's he's fluent in both English and Spanish. He, it's, you know, not just – we'll get to the physical tools in a second, but, like, grew up around the game. Like, he's got relatives who play baseball. His brother, you know, was drafted – or signed by the Marlins, traded to the Twins in the offseason. Um, you know, so he's grown up around the game, so he kind of knows what to expect. Like, we interviewed him on our podcast back, I want to say – I can't remember if it was late January, early February, shortly after he signed. He's very comfortable, very mature. Uh, you know, he he. it's not just physical tools. He has a good approach at the plate. He, you know, he, he understands some of the technical standpoints of, of catching. He, you know, communicates well, like you know, runs a pitching staff amazingly well for a 17-year-old. So it's like you almost have to throw the age out the window. And then the tools, I mean, we could be talking plus hit, plus power, plus arm, plus field. It's not going to be plus run because he's a catcher, but he runs close to average. You know, in terms of getting, you know, to San Diego, I mean, it seems like he's kind of on track to get there at 19 years old, you know, whether that's the end of 2025 or the first couple of months of 2026. And, you know, maybe, you know, he might be quicker. I mean, the way he's going, he maybe he's quicker than that, Ben. I mean, I, I, I do like to say, I mean, the guys who are the special talents, they just destroy any timetable and they get there when they're ready, which is quicker than expected. I mean, Jackson Merrill's kind of doing, I mean, he's not going to get to big leagues when he's 19 because he's 20 already, but like 
Jackson Merrill is probably going to be in the big leagues next year at this at this rate. You know, three you know three years after being drafted out of high school, um, and I just think the special talents. You can sit there and, and put an ETA or say, okay, here's kind of the development plan. Like I remember going through this. He was just in the news because I think the Mariners, I don't know if they retired his number or put him in their ring of honor, but like Felix Hernandez, you know, was mm-hmm. celebrated at in, in Seattle, uh, I think last weekend. And it was the same thing. Like Felix was so advanced at like age 17. And it was like, okay, we want him to do, you know, pitch this many innings at this many levels. And Felix just blew past all that and got to Seattle even quicker. I mean, A Rod did that. Ken Griffey Jr. did yeah. that. Um, and, you know, I think the guys who are really special players, you could sit there and, and kind of say, okay, this is what makes sense, and they blow it up. So I, I think he's going to blow it up. So you could see this potentially as something where, let's say the Padres, they have Luis Camposano be the catcher for a couple years, or they bring back Gary Sanchez because that's worked so far, and they give him a couple years. And after that contract is up, you could just see Ethan Salas ending up being the guy there and maybe camp yeah, is still on the roster have that combination right when salas comes up yeah and honestly i think it's one of those things i think when ethan salas is ready and again he's 17 i'm not saying it's gonna be tomorrow but he's better than Luis camposano he's better than gary sanchez and even if those guys are under contract or you know you know whoever's on the roster it's the same thing like when, when ethan salas tells you i'm ready i'm ready to play in the big leagues it does not matter who you have a catcher or what the plan is or what the contracts are. Ethan Salas is going to be your catcher. So yeah, he's, he's that talented. I mean, it was, I was talking to somebody with the Padres when we were working on our top on our prospects list. And he said that they had another team tell them that considering his age and how many years, obviously of play he has ahead of him, that this other team considered Ethan Salas the most valuable player in baseball. And that includes big leaguers because he's this good at 17 and is going to have however many years of a major league career. Like, I mean, this guy is crazy, crazy talented. Yeah, that is very high praise. And AJ, I don't, I don't think it's AJ, right? It's Chris Kemp, I believe, that did like the main work on Ethan Salas. Is that? Think yeah, I think correct? he's in charge of international. I mean, I think AJ. I think AJ is more heavily involved in in, in some of this stuff than than probably all, all like your amateur and international stuff than your typical GM is because that's where his background was and he loves it. But yeah, I mean, I mean, there are a lot of people who obviously did work on it. But yeah, I mean, it's like he's he's incredibly ridiculously good. Yeah, and I just bring that up with Chris Kemp because there's been a lot of talented young players that have come into the Padres organization and it's not just through the draft. So I just want Padres fans to be aware of that. And not all of them have hit, right? There's been some disappointments. There's been some injuries, right? With Adrian Morajon and Michelle Baez. He's still in the Padres system uh, in the minor leagues after getting some major league time. So it's not a guarantee for all of these guys to hit, but Ethan Salas, it's just on a totally different level than what praise any of former Padres prospects were receiving when they first came into the system. And again, Ethan Salas is 17. So I don't want to put these super high expectations on him, but other people are doing that for me. And so it's like, and that know this obviously way better than I do. So it's hard for me to sit here and be like, well, just Padre fans, lower the expectations. Now he's not going to be here tomorrow, like you said, but I think the Padres, after having a long history of not being able to have that like star catcher, I think that time can come uh, here in a couple years, a few years. So we'll see what happens there. Uh, Jim Callis, MLB.com. Thank you so much for the time. I really do appreciate that. Hopefully Padres fans uh, appreciated this conversation as well. Uh, And keep up the great work. I appreciate it, man. Hey, no problem. You too, Ben. You keep up the great work. It's always fun talking talking Padres with you. And I mean, we're running out of time. I still think they have time. I, I, the team should be. If you didn't know their record, they, you would think they'd be a playoff team. If you just looked at yeah. the performance, with especially how good the pitching staff's been. I know the offense has been a little up and down, but I think they still have what the best pitching staff in the National League in terms of ERA, and they're in the middle of pack of scoring. Like the record makes no sense. So I, I still think there's time to turn it around. And I still like the future of this team, even if, if this year winds up being a little disappointing. Yeah, and we'll see how this year ends up. I mean, the Padres, they just obviously had that good Orioles series. But 
as I've said to my viewers, my listeners, they've done that before this season where they've had a good series or a good week, and then they can't just you know finish it up. They, they can't follow that up, be consistent. So we'll see if it ends up happening. But they have the star talent there, and that will provide hope, I think, for a lot of Padres fans. All right, episode 448, Talking Friars, brought to you by Gaglione Bros, famous cheese steaks and garlic fries. This is their main location on Friars Road. It's also available at Petco Park as well. Again, thank you so much to Jim Callis for the time, and I'll see you all later. Thanks so much for tuning in here.